In the next few videos, I'll be explaining a few more MIPS instructions. But before I do that, I just want to first explain how data is organized in memory. So we've already talked about the fact that you have some registers, in our case, 32 registers sitting on the processor chip, and the rest of the data is sitting away in memory. And as far as the program is concerned, it has access to a large amount of memory which is stored in contiguous locations, right? So what is the program's view of this virtual memory? So this memory starts at address zero and, you know, maybe it goes on until say 64 gigabytes. The first few bytes of memory are reserved to store the program itself. That is, that is the code that belongs to the program. So if the program is 400 instructions long and each instruction takes four bytes, then I need to reserve the first 1600 bytes for the program code itself. Okay, and at that point, this would be the base address from where the variables start getting stored. And the first set of variables that are stored are the global variables that belong to the program, right? So the very first few variables that I declare before I execute anything, they get stored in this global region. And the pointer to this global region is stored in a special register referred to as $GP. Okay, so the value that would be stored in $GP in this example would be 1600, saying that that's the address where my variables are being located. So the compiler knows all the variables that have been declared at the start. Those get allocated beforehand in this, in this global region over here. And then from that point on, variables are allocated based on need. So at compile time, the compiler does not know what's going to get placed in this region over here, right? So that gets determined at runtime. Okay, so firstly, the stack is used to store the statically defined variables for every single procedure that you invoke. Okay, so when you first call the function main in, in a C program, then it's variable. So all the variables that are defined inside main that is the variables that are only accessible to function main are going to get allocated over here, right? So if function main starts by declaring uh, three variables, those get allocated on the stack. If function main now calls some other function, its variables then start getting defined on top of the stack over here. Once that function finishes, its variables get deallocated from the stack and so on. So the stack keeps moving up and down based on the functions that get called and the variables that are defined inside those functions. Now, every time a program also creates dynamic memory. So in some programming languages like C, every time you need to create space, you introduce a malloc call, which then allocates a certain amount of memory and then gives it to you. And managing that memory and managing the addresses in that memory are really up to the programmer. Okay, so the way that is done, when you call a malloc, there is data being allocated for you on the heap. And the heap starts where the global variables end. And as you allocate and ask for more memory, the heap size is going to keep growing in the upward direction. Okay, that's where the stack is concerned. You start at a high address and you keep decrementing the addresses, the more stack space that you need. The heap, on the other hand, as you ask for more heap space, the values of the heap addresses keep on increasing. So some of this will be made more clear as we look at examples. One more thing I just want to point out is that when a procedure allocates some space for itself on the stack, right, in this case, let's say that function main has allocated, you know, this region over here on the stack. The frame pointer, so there's a special register referred to as the frame pointer, which points to the start of that procedure's space. And stack pointer refers to the end of that procedure space. Okay, so just keep this in mind and you know we'll go through more examples. Now let's look at this uh, example over here. So imagine that I have the C code which says A equals B plus C. Okay, and note that A, B, and C are global variables, right? So before you even executed anything in the code, there were variables A, B, and C that were defined. And then you get into your main function and the first instruction that you encounter in main is, you know, A equals B plus C. So before I do anything, I have to first set global pointer to have the right value. So let's say that the program had 250 instructions, each instruction being four bytes long, which means that the text region or the code region needs 1000 bytes of space. 
So the global variables have to start at base address 1000. Okay, so I start by putting 1000 into my global pointer. So the first thing I'm doing is putting 1000 into global pointer by adding 1000, the image at value 1000 to, uh, to special register 0. Once that is done, I need to load the values of B and C into registers. Okay, since A is the first variable that was declared, A is going to be at offset 0 from the global pointer. B is going to be at offset 4 from the global pointer and C is going to be at offset 8 from the global pointer. Right? Every variable in this case requires 4 bytes of storage. So I first do a load word and I bring variable B into register S2. I then bring variable C into register S3. I add them up, put the result in register S1. And now I need to store the value in S1 back into the memory space reserved for variable A which is at $GP, right? So variable A is at offset zero from the global pointer. What I'm also doing in this example is I'm adding 12 to the global pointer and putting it into register S4. Okay, so in this example, as I'm going to build on it, you'll see that there was also a variable declared over here, which was an array of 10 values named D10. Okay, so the, so the start of this array D is going to be at 12 away from the global pointer okay and so that's why I've added 12 to the global pointer and stored it into S4 so S4 now has the address of the start of array D so it, it's essentially a pointer to array element D0 right it has the address of D0 so I'm going to build on that in this next example here so the next line of code let's say was taking D2 adding A to it and then storing that value into D3 so the corresponding assembly instructions would be as follows. So since S4 is a pointer to D0, to get D2, I need to add 8 bytes to it. right? So I add 8 to S4. That gives me the address of D2. I bring that value into temporary register T0. Since the value of A is already sitting in S1, I add S1 to T0. The result is saved again in T0. And then I store T0 into the address of D3, right? And how do I get the address of D3? I add 12 to S4, right? So S4 is a pointer to D0. I add 12 to it to get the address of D3. And then I store the value in T0 into that address. So now before I get into more examples, I just want to make sure that everybody understands how numbers are represented in decimal, binary, and hexadecimal form. If you're already familiar with these representations, you can skip the next minute or so and jump on to the next slide. So let's just first take decimal numbers. If I mention the decimal number 35, what does that really represent? That's basically 3 times 10 to the power 1 plus 5 times 10 to the 0. And that same formula is used for any other kind of encoding as well. So in terms of binary encoding, if you see a large number like this, that's nothing but 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 0 times 2 to the 2, 0 times 2 to the 3, 0 times 2 to the 4, and then 1 times 2 to the 5, which is shown here. Right, And so once you add these up, you get the value for this binary number as well. Hexadecimal is a close cousin of binary. It's just a more compact representation. So instead of doing you know, 2 to the 0, you start with 16 to the 0. Okay, so this is, this is the nomenclature that shows that what comes up next is a hexadecimal number. Okay, so 23 is written here in hexadecimal format. And what it really refers to is 2 times 16 to the 1 plus 3 times 16 to the 0. Okay, and obviously if I'm using base 16, I need 16 different alphanumeric characters to represent every single digit, right? So that's done by using numbers 0 through 9 for the first 10 digits and then letters A through F for the next few. So A refers to the number 10, B refers to the number 11, C to the number 12 and so on until F finally refers to the number 15. Down here I'm showing you this table of numbers 0 through 15 in decimal, binary and hexadecimal formats.